Hello, and welcome to this webcast on Oversight of Corporate Culture. I'm Cindy Fernelli, Executive Director of the Center for Audit Quality, and I'm pleased to moderate our discussion today, which is brought to you by the Anti-Fraud Collaboration. The Anti-Fraud Collaboration represents the joint efforts of the Center for Audit Quality, Financial Executives International, the National Association of Corporate Directors, and the Institute of Internal Auditors. These organizations are all actively engaged in efforts to promote the integrity of financial reporting. Sound corporate culture is a cornerstone of fraud deterrence and detection. And today our distinguished panel will highlight leading practices on assessing and strengthening your corporate culture. But before we get started, I have a few housekeeping matters. As noted on slide two, I am pleased to announce that this webcast qualifies for 1.8 CPE credits for the behavioral ethics field of study and one NACD specific credit, which can be applied to one of two fellow programs offered by the NACD. For those of you who have registered for either CPE and or NACD credit, you must confirm your attendance throughout this webcast by clicking the participation pop-up markers. To qualify, you must respond to at least 75% of the participation markers. So when you see the pop-up marker, simply cl click the green arrow. If you did not register for CPE or NACD credit, you can just ignore the pop-up markers. They'll disappear within a moment or two if they're not clicked. Finally, please note that at the end of this webcast, there will be an evaluation and we'd be very grateful for your feedback. So now let's turn to today's program. Slide three sets out our three goals for this webcast. First, we will explore how organizations define culture and leverage it as a corporate asset. Second, we will address oversight responsibilities of audit committees, members, company management, and internal auditors. And we'll also touch on how the external auditor considers a company's culture when scoping and conducting the audit. Finally, we will highlight leading practices on assessing and strengthening a company's corporate culture. We have a wonderful panel of experts with us today to help us meet those objectives. So let's turn to slide four for a quick introduction of each panelist. In alphabetical order, we'll start with Mark Carowin. Mark is the Chief Compliance Officer for Citigroup. In this role, he's responsible for, clients, for compliance risk management across city and reports to the CEO. Previously, Mark was the chief auditor and managing director responsible for city's internal audit department. So Mark, we very much look forward to hearing from you and thank you for joining us. Well, I'm very pleased to be here. Thank you very much. Also with us is Brenda Gaines, who is a director and audit committee chair at Tenet Healthcare. She also serves as a director of Southern Company Gas. Brenda retired as president and CEO of City Corps Diners Club, and prior to her time at City, she served as the deputy chief of staff to Chicago's mayor, and also as Chicago's commissioner of housing. Brenda, we're very glad to have you here. Thank you for inviting me. Our third panelist is Jilly Lord. Jilly is a practicing audit partner at PwC UK's and PwC UK's Head of Audit Strategy and Transformation. She also sits on PwC UK's Assurance Executive Board. In her role, Jilly is responsible for the development of the UK firm's operating model, technology, and tools. She also leads the UK firm on issues of assurance regulation and public policy. Jilly, welcome to you. Thank you for having me. And last, but by no means least, is Paul Walker. Paul is the Shira Zurich Chair in Enterprise Risk Management at St. John's University and the Executive Director of the Center for Excellence in Enterprise Risk Management at St. John's. He is also a member of the COSO ERM Advisory Council, and we're very glad to have you with us today, Paul. Thank you. It's my pleasure to be here. So, turning to slide five, let's dive into the substance of our program. And Brenda, I'm going to start my first question with you. I know that a, a big part when we talk about culture is, is defining what organizational culture means. And you were a member of the NACD Blue Ribbon Commission that recently published a report on culture. In fact, it's entitled Culture as a Corporate Asset. 
So I know the commission probably deliberated a bit, a bit on a definition of culture. Can you tell us a bit about those deliberations and how you ended up defining culture? Yes, we did, and that was actually the first thing we had to do. And it was amazing about all of the different definitions of culture. But we decided on one that was characterized by Edgar Schein, who was a former professor at MIT and a noted author on organizational development. And Professor Schein said, a culture is a series of assumptions individuals make about an organization visible through public statements, organizational structures, key processes, stated goals and aspirations, and basic beliefs. Clearly, if you accept that characterization, then it's clear that um, culture is different in every organization. There is no one size fits all. The other thing that NACD stated was that it's important that the values, strategy, uh, beliefs, and the business model uh, of an organization be aligned with that corporate culture if you want it to work. So Paul, I'm going to turn to you because you are an advisory council member on COSO and you were involved at the development of the 2017, a recent COSO Enterprise Risk Management Framework. Can you tell us a, a bit on defining the desired culture, why that's so important to an organization? Oh, oh, yes, first a plug on the framework. The framework is, is all about mission, vision, performance, and, and adding value. So, so the framework is very much about trying to be a successful organization. And, and one of the keys to that is culture. And in fact, in, in the definition in the COSO ERM 2017 framework, it's clearly stated that ERM is not a department but enterprise risk or managing your risk towards greater value it is defined as the culture, the capabilities, and the practices. So, so it, it would seem that what we're saying is, is that it is essential to being a successful organization, and it's actually there in the definition. And the great part about the framework is it sort of bookends culture. There's a principle up front uh, that, that says you need to define your desired culture. And then there's another principle then towards the end, principle 20, that says when you report on risk and performance, you should also report on culture. So it really sets up culture really well as something that's critical to success. So Julie, picking up on the comments that we heard both Paul and Brenda make, um, that culture is um, company specific, if mm -hmm. you will. You've walked through uh, the hallways of many companies as an external auditor. Uh, share with us a little bit about uh, examples where you've seen a company's values and strategies that were well aligned. Okay, so the example I'm going to use is actually PwC, my own firm. Um, and in our audit business, our, our vision, our strategy, if you like, is that we're trying to be the leading provider of assurance services. And we've just gone through a values refresh exercise um, to set out really clearly for all of our people what values we should be embracing as we work towards that vision. And they include acting with integrity, also the need to care for our clients and our people. Um, and those values, we've worked really hard to make sure they're aligned to that overall strategic vision. Um, and when I was um, preparing for this webcast, I was thinking about the types of values that wouldn't work for an audit firm. Um, and I came across a value that I think one of the big US retailers actually holds close to their heart, which is that the customer is always right. And if you imagine that in an audit context, clearly that wouldn't work because as auditors, we've got to always have the ability to be skeptical, to be challenging and so on. So that value would clearly be at odds with our, with our strategy and what we're trying to be. So it's a really simple example, but it shows how important it is that you absolutely work so hard and give so much thought to getting values that support your strategic vision and that then can enable you to create a culture that everybody understands and can buy into. So I'm going to turn this over to you, slide six, and Mark, I'm going to turn to you now as well. And given what Julie just said about the various components that go into a company's culture uh, and, and values, right, because culture and values are, are very uh, linked up, how do values man manifest themselves in employees' behaviors? Well, it's, it's a great question and one that we have thought about uh, a lot at City. Uh, as have uh, a number of financial services institutions uh, after the crisis, which now is 
as nearly a decade uh, behind us, but still should be absolutely uh, uh, in the front of our, our thoughts. Uh, and so what, what we did at City was step back and look at what is a, a good ethical culture framework. And it's very interesting, the, the diagram that we have here uh, does reflect uh, the, uh, the types of thoughts that, that we came up uh, in independently within our organization because what we ultimately want to do is ensure that uh, if we have the right ethical culture uh, in the organization, then we will have appropriate behaviors. Uh, and, uh, and so that's what we want to, to do is to promote the positive um, uh, appropriate behaviors. So we en engaged a, uh, a professor, uh, David Miller, uh, at uh, Princeton uh, to help us think about that framework. And we came up with a, uh, a definition that looked at uh, three components, uh, wh which we call the right, the good, and the fitting, which align very well with the norms, beliefs, and, and values that we have there. Uh, and if we think about the, the norms, uh, for us in financial services, uh, it certainly is going to be compliance with laws, rules, regulations, and the policies in the organization. Those are the norms in which we should operate. And those should drive uh, ensuring that we give the right sort of products and services in compliance with the law, but also that the products are suitable uh, and that we are treating our customers fairly. So we move into that, that area of uh, beliefs and values because we, uh, uh, above all things, are there for our clients and customers. And, then, and so when it's going to the good, you're looking at the benefit that's, that's derived and we want to ensure that there's no detriment um, um, because it, there, are, there are times when some will benefit but, but others won't. And so we have to, have to have that balance and fairness. And then ultimately, uh, looking at that third component of values, that's the, the fitting. Is that the sort of thing that um, you could tell your mother you did that deal? The, the, you know, it, it's uh, what's at the core, what do you believe in, and what does your organization uh, want to, uh, to be known for in, in terms uh, of serving its customers. And so we, we've set up a framework that makes us focus on those three, th three components, the right, the good, the fitting, the norms, the beliefs, and the values, uh, with the view that if we get those right, then we will have the right sort of behaviors in the organization. Excellent. That's a good way to think about it. So, Paul, uh, we're going to go over to slide seven, and I want to talk a little bit about a challenge culture. So, uh, there may be multiple cultures within an organization, and I think Mark picked up a little bit of that and hinted at some of that in his remarks. And I know a few years ago, you led a study that the Association of Chartered Certified Accountants and the Institute of Management Accountants uh, took on that looked at elements of a challenge culture. What is a challenge culture? Um, well, first I want to say that study was based on interviewing um, not a large sample, but a good size sample, CEOs and CFOs and board members. A and we uh, literally went around the world for that study. So the sponsors of the study said to me, I, I don't want a US version of this. So they, they sent me to your hometown. Mm -hmm. um, and then we went over to Dubai. And so we tried to get uh, sort of, no matter where you are in the world, what's your view of the subject? And the thing that came out of that study was, one, the definition, but what also came out of it was the passion that CEOs and CFOs and board members had about getting this conversation correct uh, and, and going the right way. And so as part of that study, feedback from them, we asked, well, what does this mean to you? And we came up with this official definition, which is on the screen, but it's a culture that uh, encourages, requires, and rewards challenging questions. And in this particular study, we were focusing on what I almost call the, the, the neck of culture. So the C-suite and the board is really at the very top. And so we wanted to get in their minds and understand about the relationship between the C-suite and the board. And so they told us, and I believe the NACDs, their great material is showing uh, some similar things, that it's important to get that conversation and that relationship right and be allowed to ask those questions, or those challenging questions between the board and the C-suite. As opposed to, we heard people confess without attribution, stories of people rushing things through the board meetings, executives trying to get a strategy signed off very, very quickly, 
or we heard people admitting we have groupthink. We all think alike and we need more diversity on the board to sort of challenge our thinking or we don't take bad news at this company even though we know we're supposed to. So, so it was trying to get the conversation moving in the right direction instead of uh, avoiding some of the problems that they've been seeing in the past. The other thing that came out of that study was there are elements to a challenge culture. So in that study we have the, the different dimensions or elements of the way it might show up. So board members could use the study to self-assess. Uh, obviously there's some sensitive questions in there, but they can use it to self-assess and have a conversation between the C-suite and the board about uh, do you ask challenging questions and are you allowed? Well, so let's pick up on that challenging <laughs> question point, if we could, Brenda, and going on to slide eight. Um, I know that uh, Stanford uh, University earlier this year uh, did a study, published a study on board dynamics and found that nearly half of the directors surveyed indicated that their fellow, direct their fellow directors <laughs> don't encourage dissenting views and just over half, 53%, believe some members of the board are reluctant to express their point of view in front of management. Does what Paul told us or this study surprise you? It, it really doesn't surprise me that there was, there were some board members who felt that way. The number surprised me. I was surprised that it was so high. And the Blue Ribbon Commission did talk about it. Um, and I think that, you know, for those board members who answered that they really didn't think that their boards asked tough questions, they may want to take a, a look at their boardroom mm -hmm. and ask some tough questions themselves. And I really liked uh, Paul's characterization of a challenge culture because they should be asking tough questions of management. And they should also observe w what are the reactions when they ask a question? What are the reactions of management? What are the reactions of the other board members? Uh, and when a question is asked, you know, ask or a suggestion is made, what happens to it? Does a group just simply move on to the next question? Or do they say, hey, wait a minute, let's talk and let's think about this. I think the other thing is, is that boards need to make sure that there's adequate time for really um, comprehensive discussions mm -hmm. about strategy, about succession planning, about performance, and not simply, here's the presentation, we really, you know, we're, we're looking at our watch, we've got to go now. Uh, I think we all have to make time for those things. So sticking with slide eight, uh, Mark, I want to turn to you. City, of course, is a global, large, multi-country, uh, uh, let alone city organization. And of course, norms and beliefs and values differ uh, from country to country. And so how does a company like City address those challenges in addressing culture uh, across so many different jurisdictions? Well, it, it's a great question, and if we reflect for a moment on um, the organization that is Citigroup, uh, for those who aren't aware, uh, we operate in around 100 countries and have um, our customers over 160 uh, countries of the world. And um, uh, as you've, uh, you've suggested, it's really important for us uh, to have uh, that, um, uh, that ethical uh, culture framework uh, promulgated across the organization uh, so that all of the values that we were talking about um, uh, a moment ago uh, actually make it through to each of the countries, each of the businesses. Um, and uh, since we're on the, the topic also of board dynamics, um, we have uh, a, uh, uh, over 120 material legal entities uh, and, uh, uh, and a number of those have independent non-executive directors, about 150 independent non-executive directors around the world for various legal entities. And so we need to see that credible challenge, that challenge culture that was being described uh, and again have that uh, move from entity to entity both uh, from the top down, but also to encourage that bottom-up escalation. Uh, and so um, we look at uh, what are some of the key components of an appropriate risk culture, uh, and they include having that right tone from the top that comes from the chairman uh, and, uh, and is uh, cascaded to both the board members and for the board members to encourage management to engage in that credible challenge. 
Second is to link that to the communication standards that are uh, in the organization and appropriate training that promote and encourage um, that type of interaction. And that when you get the, the benefit of uh, a board and series of boards that are so diverse in, in each country, diverse by all the dimensions, you have that wealth of knowledge and experience about the marketplace, about the customer groups, about the laws and requirements in the jurisdiction. Uh, it, it's a rich source of, of knowledge and information, and you want to promote uh, and advocate that. Then, you know, when things go uh, uh, come up or surfaced, um, having the right sort of culture so that it, it's not um, a, uh, a a blame culture, but you you encourage and you advocate that yes, things do go wrong. How do we ensure that that ac accountability results in a positive outcome? So I call it identification, mm -hmm. escalation, remediation. Think positively about it. And then ultimately, um, how, how do you promote and incentivize people? Uh, and so I want to ensure that we think about, uh, in the context of an ethical culture and the behaviors, um, not, not thinking about the misconduct, um, but what, what are the the positive things that we're trying to promote and to incentivize the positive result. And th so those are some of the thoughts. So I'm hearing a difference between a challenge culture and a blame culture. Absolutely. Fact, yeah, right? absolutely. <laughs> so we're going to move on to slide nine. And Brenda, I have a question for you. And in fact, one of our viewers has a similar question. Okay. <laughs> so that's good that we're in sync with our viewers. <laughs> um, but one of the recommendations made by the NACD's Blue Ribbon Commission was the, the need for companies to establish clarity on the foundational elements mm -hmm. of, uh, and, and uh, the foundational elements of values and culture uh, within a company. And, and tell me what that entails. And the way that the viewer uh, stated it is, what are the components of an organization's culture? And, and what's the process to determine those things? So okay. similar questions, I okay. think. Okay. Um, I, I think, let me ask your, answer your question first and then talk about the components. Um, I think that, that it's important if, uh, th that a board to establish clarity, ask the CEO to provide a, a narrative to them, short narrative, not a tome, but a short narrative on what are the key elements of that company's culture? Uh, why are they important to the success of the companies? of the company, and how are they going to be measured? Because metrics are very important to have to make sure that, in fact, the things are happening that you want to see happening. I think the elements, uh, again, depend on the company. So for instance, if you are in healthcare and care about, uh, uh, obviously, you know, building your company, one of the things that you want to make sure of is patient care and patient satisfaction and the quality of care. And so that would be a key part of the culture of the company. And what are the metrics around those? If you are in manufacturing or, on, or in utilities, one of the things that you'd want to make sure is that you have safety metrics. Are your customers safe? Are your employees safe? So those could be key elements. And again, it, it depends on the industry. You could go on, obviously, for retail. What's the store look like? How are you treating your customers? <laughs> to Jilly's <laughs> example, the customer is always right in a retail environment. So again, it's customer specific. Which I think you touched on another question that we got, and that is how does one test for values? And I think you, again, have to get it specific to your organization's mm -hmm. values and culture. So Jilly, I'm, I'm going to talk to you about specifically what behaviors drive mm -hmm. culture, because after all, it is behaviors that drive culture. Right, and I think this is also a really important part of testing for values, um, because if you look at behaviors, you can genuinely start to observe tangible things. So yes, I think behaviors drive culture, but I also think that cultures drive behaviors. And then in fact, what we should be working towards is this sort of virtuous circle where you set your culture, your people behave in the way that you, you want and expect, and that reinforces the culture. And of course that can, sadly sometimes, be a vicious circle as well if you don't quite get it right and you get the wrong behaviors and they reinforce the wrong culture. Um, 
So, so I guess the key point to understand here is that culture is continuously being shaped by all of the micro behaviors that are around us. Things as simple as, do you say good morning to the security guard when you come in the morning? That's a really good illustration of you know, a company's values and ultimately of, of its culture. Um, so behaviors and these micro behaviors shape culture. That means that culture is very dynamic. And here I think there's something really important to look out for. And, and we experienced this horribly in the UK with um, and many of your viewers will have read about the LIBOR rate fixing scandal that impacted us in the UK, where some people were fixing interest rates for their own, for their own benefit. Um, and when that was all investigated, actually one of the things that was found is that over really quite a long period, people's behaviors had changed just a tiny bit, maybe almost every day. And this very, very gradual process of small changes in behavior, small changes in culture, more changes in behaviors, actually led to a point where truly terrible and very, very wrong things were happening. But because it had all happened so gradually, it was very easy to miss, and it was missed. Um, so that, I think, is a really salutary example of culture being dynamic, behaviors driving culture, and if you don't really watch for that very, very carefully, you can end up in a really bad place. So we've gotten two questions from the audience that touch on the same thing, and, and uh, we'll move on just a, a moment, but I, wanna, I do wanna address these two questions, and basically they are, what do you do when, whether it's the board of directors or those charged with setting and testing and uh, overseeing compliance with culture aren't living the company's values or culture. And so um, I, I think maybe, Jilly, you might have a point of view, and Mark, you may too, given your role mm -hmm. at City, you probably have to be on the lookout for that. Yeah, well, and, and I think that the, uh, the, the most important uh, uh, item is that tone that we described a moment mm -hmm. before. And whether it's tone from the top, from the, uh, the board, or uh, the, uh, the C-suite, uh, or from the control functions, uh, or in, indeed um, those who are charged with independent assessment and assurance, internal audit or indeed external mm -hmm. audit, mm -hmm. um, uh, because they are all part of that cultural ecosystem, um, because they, they do set the tone and, uh, a and help drive uh, for better or, or for worse uh, the subsequent behaviors in the, in the organization. Uh, and so there, there is uh, a big challenge on uh, the people who lead those respective activities, the boards, the CEOs, the heads of departments, um, uh, and the heads of the, the control functions and assurance okay. functions to uh, ensure that they are setting the example. And, and we call that um, uh, not just the tone from the top, but the shadow of the leader. And you have to recognize mm -hmm. that when so. people see what you do, then that is their cue for, uh, for what uh, happens um, when they are the, the top person in the room. And so uh, we strongly encourage and, and make it one of the key components of our leadership standards in the organization uh, to, uh, to uh, both identify, uh, evaluate, and give feedback to people promptly about what sort of shadow they are casting. Uh, and is that driving the positive sorts of behaviors in an ethical culture, um, uh, or are they not? And ultimately, whether it's in our conduct risk program uh, or uh, uh, as an internal auditor, uh, and I would expect as an external auditor to call it out uh, and, uh, and, and to escalate that. And it needs to be done um, delicately um, because what we want to do is to promote the right behavior and not to create a bad behavior in the way that you're doing it. But it's absolutely essential that, that one raises it uh, promptly uh, and, uh, and drives for the right sort of outcome. Yeah, so I agree with you. It's all about calling it out. And in fact, obviously sometimes that can be incredibly hard and we all have whistleblowing systems and so on to help people in what can be very difficult situations. I think something else you can do to make it easier for people 
is, is make it a really frequent topic of conversation. Give people the vocabulary. Make it not a big deal to say, um, hey, you know what you just said? I'm not sure that was quite consistent with whatever. No big deal. We'll just talk about it and colleague, we're colleagues. And if we're able to have those sort of ordinary conversations, then you can actually deal with an awful lot um, without things having always to escalate into really tough com tough and that, and situations. And that's the important thing about the credible challenge that we right. spoke about before, because the way you suggested of diffusing it right then, saying, not, not sure I agree with that, um, rather than making it something that you take back later and, and kind of escalating it, but, but making it part of the, the living culture of the right. organization. So both of you are talking about the small behaviors and addressing them early on and when you can still address them and it's collegial and maybe the person hasn't even done anything wrong but just some red flags have gone up. Brenda, how does the board get a handle on those small behaviors? Uh, do, you, do you feel that you can get a handle on those things as before they become something that gets reported into the ethics line or before we have an internal investigation? Is there a way for the board to get a sense for those small behaviors and how they're being addressed sure. or is that not the board's role? Well, it, it, it's interesting that, that you asked that because NACD just published the 2017-2018 uh, Public Corporate Governance Survey where they look at over 500 companies. And one of the questions was about tone at the top. And 87% of respondents said they understood the tone at the top. Then they asked about tone at the middle. <laughs> about 35% of the respondents <laughs> said they had a good handle on tone at the middle. Then they said, what about you know, the worker, you know, the person in the factory? Uh, what about them? And only 18% said that they knew whether or not that was a healthy culture or not. And so I think that there's work to be done. However, I think there are some things that you can do. And one of them is um, I think all board members need to get out of the boardroom and get to the sites, whether it's a store, whether it's a hospital, whether it's installing gas lines, whatever that company does, I think board members need to see it, need to talk to employees, need to be there. And I think there has to be a healthy discussion about it. I think the other thing is, is that um, uh, aud the, the folks in internal audit play a big role in terms of, and in compliance, play a big role because they're, there, they're out there all the time. And so what are they finding? What are they seeing? Do you understand what's behind that written report? And I think board members have to, to ask questions and make sure that, they, that they're getting fulsome answers about them. Um, and I think it's, it's important that, you know, if, you, if internal audit is saying something about a, an organization um, and the organization doesn't remediate it appropriately, then why don't we, why doesn't the audit committee have a conversation with the head of that organization? So I think we have to probe and ask questions that you may not want to ask to make sure it doesn't blow up and get bigger than a bread box. <laughs> so I'm going to move us on to slide 10 and we're a little behind schedule but that's okay because I think we had a good dialogue around some of the prompted by some of the audience questions so audience keep those coming in. Um, so Mark I'm going to turn to you and we've talked about defining a culture, building a culture, the components of a good culture, but maybe we should have started the other way and said, well, why do that? What is the value uh, of culture? Or, or in other words, is culture an asset and why isn't it an asset? And so I know that um, the Gallup organization did a recent State of the American Workplace study and found that there were indeed competitive advantages to engaging employees, uh, to making sure that, that uh, employees uh, saw the strong values and culture as a benefit to them and to the organization. So talk to us a little bit about what the advantages are for a company that has engaged employees. Well, if, if we start with uh, why, why are we in a company, or indeed why are we in whether it's uh, the private sector or the public sector? Well, it's ultimately going to be to uh, provide some sort of service uh, to customers. Uh, and I think it's really important that we start off with that customer focus. Uh, and then we think about, well, 
um, in, in delivering that service, whatever it is. Uh, we, we want uh, to ensure that we are meeting uh, uh, the values that, um, that make our, our product or service attractive to them to serve their needs. Uh, and, um, and then it follows from there that if you have uh, a, a good ethical culture, you're more likely uh, to uh, have those behaviors that are attentive to and respond to those, um, the, those values that the, the customers are after, whether it's a safe product mm -hmm. or, or good medical care uh, or on-time um, uh, uh, delivery of, um, of a transportation service, wh whatever it is. And so uh, you, you want to have in that um, uh, in that organization, uh, that infrastructure, and I mean that infrastructure from a cultural perspective, that helps one uh, uh, identify what's working well and when things aren't working well, uh, how to uh, how to correct it, and for someone to raise their hand and to feel comfortable, this isn't working as, as well as it should, and we all know the industries. Um, uh, the, uh, where it is so vital, like the airline industry, you want mm -hmm. to have, whether it's the, uh, the, the mechanic that is uh, looking at, at the engine or the landing gear uh, to be the first to raise her or his hand to say, actually, I'm a little bit concerned <laughs> about this. And I can tell you, I fly a lot, and I, would, <laughs> I want to make sure that whoever it is is raising their hand. I'd rather be an hour late than never get there. <laughs> uh, and so um, the, that, uh, um, uh, having that kind of environment, that, cult, that type of culture, makes it safer, sounder, more reliable, uh, and uh, and it promotes that ultimately the customer satisfaction that we're all trying to achieve. Well, and I think as we move on to slide eleven, we see that there are benefits to having engaged employees and happy employees. Right, this kind of ticks through uh, high-performing companies um, exhibit the following benefits, whether it's through employees or metrics, you mentioned customer satisfaction, uh, sales, all of those things. The, the, again, those things are linked to employee satisfaction, employee engagement, and then company performance. A absolutely, and it's, it's a very virtuous circle because if you know you're meeting the customer expectations, mm -hmm. you're going to feel better about the organization in which you work with. Uh, and certainly the surveys that we conduct and, and uh, others in the marketplace, there is a high correlation between customer satisfaction and employee satisfaction because you know you're, you're achieving the goals that you're ultimately there for. And that uh, uh, means the, um, uh, as is set out in the statistics here, lower absenteeism, uh, better on-time delivery, um, you know, fewer defect rates, all of those things that are, are really important um, for people to feel proud about the organizations. And it all goes back, I think, to, uh, to having that right positive attitude, doing the right thing, uh, and, and getting the, the right result. And, and as someone who spends most of um, his time looking at control environment and, and, uh, and conduct, um, uh, it, it really drives um, uh, the, the right sort of governance, risk management, and internal control in an organization. So I think you know, a good ethical culture is absolutely fundamental to making um, the organization work right so that it delivers to the customers. So Jillian, on slide 12, we have some signifiers of a healthy culture. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you could elaborate on each of those briefly for us. Sure. Um, so firstly, when we talk about a healthy culture, I think we've got to remember that what is healthy for one organization might not be for another. Um, my auditor retailer <laughs> point that I made at the beginning. Um, but I do think there are a few things which you probably find in, in all healthy cultures. Um, I'll maybe begin with the second point on the slide, which is transparency. So it's really important that all of your people are absolutely clear on what are our values, what behavior, behaviors are expected, and how is that going to drive the culture? Because if you're not transparent about that, um, it just leaves people confused. Um, so transparency is massively important. Ownership, for me what that means is, are people allowed to own their mistakes? Do we have a culture where you are allowed to put up your hands and say, I got something wrong, um, I'm going to put it on the table and we can all learn from it? Or 
are you working in an organization where actually you're not really ever allowed to admit mistakes? And that, I think, from a cultural point of view, is extremely problematic. Um, so you can't admit mistakes. That means you hide mistakes and so on and so on, and bad stuff happens. So that ability to own problems and be able to talk about them, I think, is hugely important. Um, and finally, resilience. It's relatively easy to have a pretty happy, collaborative, pleasant culture in benign times. The real test of a culture is when tough stuff happens, when performance is difficult, whatever. Um, and the ability of culture and values and behavior to stay consistent even in those tough times, I think is a mark of a company with a really, really strong and solid culture. So moving on to slide 13, I had, <coughs> Brenda, I was going to turn to you to talk about some of this, but I think we've addressed think so. So much of it we through have. our questions from the audience. And given have. that we are just a tad bit behind, I'm going to move <laughs> us over to slide 14. And um, Paul, I'm going to talk to you a bit about um, what responsibility management has with respect. We've talked about the board's role. We've talked about the importance maybe of the CEO setting the tone and the culture. But what about the rest of the management team? Um, and particularly picking up on <laughs> Jilly's point about when things get tough. So if there's budget pressures, uh, what does that have on, impact does that have on cu culture? And um, uh, those kinds of difficult things and what management should do and maybe what board should be on the lookout for when we are in those tough times and management's faced with pressures. I think that's a great question. And so is management responsible and are various layers of management responsible? Uh, l let me answer that this way. I have, I have uh, two beautiful granddaughters and the oldest one, um, the father's Irish, but my granddaughter's <coughs> being raised in Dallas, Texas, uh, so in the deep south. Uh, and she Which says is things. Contrary to Irish. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and so I was visiting them recently, and she she said the word "duh," but sh it sounded like there were two syllables in it to me. Uh, <laughs> and so I said to my granddaughter, I said, uh, "Pardon me, Hannah, but are there two syllables in the word "duh"?" And she looked at me at Grandpa. Yeah. And so, <laughs> uh, okay, I give up as a grandparent. I'll let the parents deal with this one. And so our manager's responsible, duh, and yeah, I guess maybe that's the way you emphasize it. I, I'm not <laughs> real sure, but yeah, of course they're responsible, but l let me link it back to a couple of specific things. Um, if you're following Sarbanes-Oxley or internal control for financial reporting or the COSO internal control integrated framework, if you're following that, I love the way you said it just a few moments ago, Culture feeds control environment, and control environment feeds culture. They're, they work together. You can't really have one without the other. So if you're following that, you should be getting the message. And, and there are two specific principles. If you're trying to get sign off on SOX, and these are relevant principles, uh, principle four says you should seek candidates that fit your culture. So if you're not doing that, I'm not going to say this um, um, I want to say this carefully, but let's just assume that if you're not doing that, you might not be following good internal control and in meeting your requirements under SOX because it says you should seek candidates to fit the culture. And then there's principle eight, which is the fraud risk assessment. Um, and, and if you do a fraud risk assessment, you can learn tremendous things about your culture. So one of the major organizations here in New York, a good friend of mine launched a fraud risk assessment and asked me to give him a little guidance along the way. And at the end of the journey, about a three, four month journey, we sort of decided as a team that the biggest fraud risk you face is your culture. And some of the things that have already come up in this conversation that it's not one control or something that's, but it's this attitude of the people and the, the way they think, whether you're walking the walk and does management really support and will they really take action? It was really eye opening for this organization that it wasn't fraud risk, but it was the culture that was causing fraud risk. So, so again, just to summarize, if you're following good internal control uh, and you're trying to get SOC sign off for something similar, I think you have to do this. At least that's my, my two cents. If you're following enterprise risk management, if you're one of those organizations that's going down that road, as I said earlier, there are two principles that say define it and report on it, not just performance and risk, but, but culture. And I, as I said earlier, that word culture is, is in there 124 times. I did look. So, so the two COSO frameworks, if, you're, if you believe those are the best guidance, and I do, right, I should, 
um, <laughs> and you're trying to follow those, it's everywhere in there sort of sending you this message. And in certain industries, yours, insurance, and, and others, and probably healthcare, I assume, I'm not an expert on that, you have specific regulator requirements about culture and behavior and, and engagement, Absolutely. I believe, as well in the Absolutely. healthcare industry. So it's critical. And if that's not enough to motivate you, the federal sentencing guidelines, need I remind you, <laughs> say that you better have an effective program. You probably know this really well, right? And, and you better self-report. I mean, if you need the stick instead of the carrot, I'll just give you that one. Even in my own profession, I won't mention the university or the university president, but one of my colleagues just got admonished by her board for not good behavior as a president. And I thought, wow, even in academia, we're, we need to get this straight. Uh, when the board goes after a president and says, you need to behave and make your people behave, that's a sign that, we, yeah, we, we got something a little bit off there. So, so Mark, I'm going to turn to you because you, you, in your prior role, you were head of internal audit, and now you're the chief compliance officer. And so talk to us about, at least at City, how those two departments overlap and, and uh, integrate with one another. And then also picking up on something that Paul said that goes to a question that we got from the audience, which is how do you know when you hire someone if it's a good cultural fit? Right, well, a um, uh, number of good questions in there. I, I think um, uh, to the first, uh, the, uh, the role of the third line of defense, the internal audit function, uh, something that, that I did for a number of years, uh, I would always say that uh, I strongly and robustly um, retain my independence. Uh, and, th and that's really important. And uh, having moved from um, being the gamekeeper to uh, now a poacher and, and then the business, um, the, uh, uh, it, it is interesting to see the differences in roles and responsibilities. Um, and uh, and uh, one, I would say that uh, the, the role of the independent internal auditor uh, who evaluates what management is doing, um, whether it's the first line of defense or the second line of defense, um, uh, needs to have that independence. At the same time, um, they uh, are, uh, and I'm, I'm proud to say that um, uh, my uh, chief internal auditor, Murray McNiff, is absolutely superb at, at doing this, giving that challenge all the time, uh, while also being uh, extremely constructive and helpful to ensure that all those positive intent things that we were discussing a moment ago. And together with my colleagues, Chief Risk Officer, Chief Financial Officer, Head of Human Resources, the Head of our Operations and Technology, um, uh, and, uh, uh, and General Counsel's Office, all those control functions, uh, we work together. We, we um, have a number of senior executive oversight responsibilities where together we are and, and are meant to be the culture carriers in the organization, and that actually is part of our performance mm -hmm. evaluation as well. Are we setting that standard, that tone from the top, and, and extending that shadow, um, uh, and working with uh, in internal audit uh, as independent control functions uh, have both formal and informal responsibilities mm -hmm. to drive uh, appropriate behaviors? Some of those include uh, a formal process, which is the uh, independent control function review program, where we look at material risk takers across the group to ensure the behaviors are right, and that's done as a part of a formal process twice a year, um, uh, and, and that's part of the, uh, ensuring that, um, that we are benchmarking our people against our, our leadership standards the behaviors that we uh, that have been exhibited, do they meet our, our ethical and conduct standards uh, and report that up and, and that uh, ultimately impacts um, the, uh, the evaluations of, of individuals. Uh, but also it's all the informal stuff that we do all the time. Um, and I've forgotten the second question. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> I'm going to turn to Julie just because uh, I think we covered it. Yeah, I, well, that's the, you know what? You had a bad moderating around it, mo bad moderator asking you compound <laughs> questions, so I apologize for that. I guess that's the recovering lawyer in me. Um, so, Julie, I do want to turn to you because um, looking at slide 15, 
we are talking about a company's culture, mm -hmm. but uh, we're also talking about an organization's culture. And so I would be remiss not asking you about uh, the importance of culture at an external audit firm. I mean, right. you are in there looking at uh, the company's uh, financial reporting components, but as we've talked about already, uh, culture is, is a key foundation for all of that. So, so what about audit firms? How do you all embed culture okay, into so the work you do? It is hugely important. Um, interestingly, in the UK, it's an area of um, intensive regulatory focus at the moment. So the FRC, who are our audit regulator in the UK, are in the middle of doing their own thematic review of audit firm culture. Um, I'm sure the outcomes of that will be really interesting. Um, so audit firm culture, I think like any regulated firm, um, and I'm sure Mark will um, empathize with this, um, we are constantly having to balance attention. So we are a commercial organization. We're trying to make sustainable profits. Um, however, we've also got a, a public interest responsibility, if you like. That's the reason we're regulated, because we need to do audits. Um, and those two objectives, um, and it's the same, I think, for any regulated organization, can be at tension. Are you making profits as a bank, or are you looking after your customers and treating them fairly? Um, they don't always fit together absolutely perfectly. So the thing that is essential in an audit firm, and I suspect it's the same um, in many other regulated firms, is to be, if you're in a leadership position, to be absolutely clear. Um, First of all, acknowledge the tension. Let's not be embarrassed or ashamed about it. Um, but be really clear with your people in my organization, we will never compromise audit quality, full stop. Um, and there has to be some really, really bright line messages um, when you're carrying that public interest res responsibility. Um, so it's, I guess, an added challenge that we've got to work into our culture. Um, but clarity, reinforcement, and then living it every single day um, are the way that I, I think you've, that they're the simple ways you've got to make it work. And of course, all of the audit firms have governance structures or right. boards, if you will, that, that look at that as well. So let's turn to slide 16. Uh, and Brenda, I'm going to turn to you now and talk about how boards and management need to embed culture into strategic questions and strate strategic discussions, right? Because performance uh, at the end of the day mm -hmm. is tied to strategy. Mm -hmm. And so how do you embed the cultural discussion into a company's strategy? I, I think that's, uh, it's really, uh, involving it in every discussion you have about performance, in every discussion you have about succession planning, about retention. Uh, it's asking those questions. So for instance, you know, many times, you know, I've been in a, in a boardroom and you look at the presentation and you've seen a significant change quarter over quarter in performance. You're like, wow, that's great. Give me a little information about how you did it. What changed? What were the difference? Did you do something different? Did you have an incentive program? How did it work? So that you understand what's behind the numbers. Um, I, I think another thing um, that we did, and this is just recently, mm -hmm. um, and I'll, I'll look to Paul for this, you know, COSO just came, as he mentioned, out with a new framework. Well, we first um, talked about that framework at the audit committee, and then uh, at the next meeting, we did it with the full board. So, because it was important, it was important to see how the framework works and what an important part culture has in that. And so I think the more that, that you link uh, culture with the vision and values of the company, then the better off you are. And I think you just have to do that. Um, I think you also can ask, when you see new strategy documents, what are the implications of this with respect to different client groups or different customer groups? Is it impacting one group more than the other? Are there any unintended consequences of our new strategy? And if so, how are we going to mitigate those? So Mark, how does City, if you don't mind getting specific with us, mm -hmm. embed culture into the strategic discussions? And I think you also have something called an ethical culture framework. Do you yes. want to talk to us about that? Well, and, and it's interesting. It follows on exactly what uh, Brenda was saying with the role of the board, because at the end of the day, the 
the uh, strategy of an organization is something that is going to ultimately be uh, uh, reflected uh, across the organization based on the board's mm -hmm. values that they've set forward and how they prioritize the uh, prof profitability, growth, customer satisfaction, all of those different components. And so uh, what, uh, what City has done, uh, in addition to having um, the, the, the normal board committees uh, covering uh, audit and risk and compensation, uh, we have another permanent uh, committee of the board, uh, which is the Ethics and Culture Committee. Um, it is chaired by one of the uh, independent non-executive directors. Um, uh, in addition, the chairman of the board uh, attends uh, and the CEO uh, attends. Um, uh, I'm lucky as chief compliance officer, uh, the compliance function supports the, uh, the chair of that committee. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, the, uh, the, the objective of the committee is to have that overarching uh, look at the organization and to ask some of those questions about how, uh, how we're getting there and how we're driving the right sorts mm -hmm. of, uh, of um, uh, framework uh, in the organization. So they, they challenged um, us to uh, think about uh, the, uh, the, the right tone from the top, the, the right sort of uh, communication program, uh, ensuring that, the, uh, that there was clear accountabilities for the decisions that are being made and, uh, and how we incentivize the right uh, sorts of things as well as link um, uh, to um, uh, uh, compensation uh, on the other end, though the compensation is, is covered by the, uh, the Personnel and Compensation Committee. Um, and, uh, and so that uh, uh, gave birth to a, uh, a, a tremendous training program uh, where the idea was that uh, the, the people from the front line, uh, first line of defense and second line of defense and third line of defense would all uh, uh, co-train um, and, uh, and using the values that I described before about that right, the good, and the fitting, um, we would have a, a, a number of case studies role played um, uh, to go through the kinds of decision making that, that you may have uh, whether you're doing a deal you're de uh, or uh, uh, a teller in a, in a branch uh, dealing with a customer where you, uh, w where you have uh, thorny uh, uh, ethical cultural decisions to make and to see how um, uh, these front office traders, uh, how the control function folks uh, would deal with the challenges and, um, and it was a great learning experience. We delivered that to 35,000 uh, employees live from around the world and then did uh, um, uh, uh, webinars uh, to, to cover uh, uh, another, I think was 100,000 people and ultimately through the training went through all 200 plus thousand people. Uh, and, and each year we have refreshes of, of that type of training because it's really important, uh, we think, uh, to, uh, to get that uh, culture um, uh, throughout the organization. And it starts with, with the str strategy and that board oversight. So it's, it's very specifically saying how do, how do we communicate uh, and how do we penetrate all of those people across all those countries from all those different frameworks. Um, it's it's really exciting part of the role. <laughs> and Julie, it sounds a bit like an audit firm's system of quality control throughout the entire network. Yeah, so one of the things that I think is really important about that kind of system is um, creating the ability to really dig down and learn from things that happen, particularly, frankly, things that go wrong. And that's essential in an audit firm's quality system. Um, so I feel really um, uncomfortable when somebody tells me it was an isolated incident, Julie. Mm -hmm. You know, really nothing to talk about. Um, and I think what, what I try and achieve is a much richer quality of um, discussion where we dig down and keep asking why and so on and try to get to the root cause of things going wrong. You have to do it very carefully because I've seen another organization where that turned into a horrible process that everybody was terrified of and it felt like that blame was trying to be apportioned mm -hmm. and so on. So you have to do it in the right sensitive and responsible way. Um, 
but the ability to embed learning in, I think is massively powerful. So uh, going Paul to slide 17 and talking just a bit, and we've, I think we've touched on some of this, but information <coughs> asymmetry. Um, where key information is filtered out, I think it gets mm -hmm. to Julie's point of not talking about things that go wrong. Um, what kind of questions should management be asking to mitigate the issue? Um, well, a couple of things. Information asymmetry in the, the two studies I've done that involve board members, the one we mentioned earlier and then one a couple years before that on board risk oversight. Um, my impression from interviewing people like Brenda <laughs> is this is a serious issue. Um, and then I only have to confirm that by following the news. And there are some pretty big disasters in the last several years, one involving nonprofits, and I believe the president of that nonprofit's going to jail, prison, um, where the president knew but never told the board. And then there's another case uh, of some good friends of mine's company, a Fortune 100 company, where the board was sued last year, year and a half ago, for not knowing something that everybody else knew. And they were mm -hmm. claiming that's board, that's bad board risk oversight. How could the board not know about this? Well, it's information asymmetry. People are, they're, they're finding some way to not let the information get to the right people. And so well, I think we have to be very careful about that, but I, we've still got a business to run, right? So I just, I have one quote from one CEO when, when we were having this conversation. He said, but there has to be upfront clarity on what the parameters are. I've still got a business to run, right? He says, if this comes up, tell me right away or, or don't tell me. So he said, you've got to have a conversation about where you draw the line and what you need to know because you, you can't run with everything and you can't hide everything. We, we just simply have to get better about it. A couple big companies outside of financial industry uh, have given me a question similar to what he said earlier, maybe I should send them to you, is about how do they build an escalation process outside of the, it's not fraud, It's maybe it's not a hotline issue, right. but I need this issue to go up more sooner, and so they're looking for ways. And also, one other interesting si uh, aspect of this, some of the European companies I've looked at, they they have a, an early warning system, a and we, we don't have that in the U.S., but I've seen a couple really large European companies in their annual report talk about an early warning system and how they have, and I, I actually love that idea, I wish I could figure out exactly how to do that in some uh, some U.S. companies. So we've talked about this earlier, but you can self-assess this. Again, it's a sensitive issue for boards, for management, but you can ask questions about, do you believe you have all information? Do you believe you have full access? I loved her comment about walking around and engaging. I've heard horror stories of, oh, you, know, you don't get to talk to the board unless you earn that right. That's amazing to me, that, but some companies kind of have that process. So, so boards have got to ask, do we have all information? Do we have full access? And then another form of information asymmetry that's come up two or three times already is if you don't have enough time. So I could, yeah, let you have the information, but give you so little time to digest it that I'm really I'm forcing you to not be able to look at everything. Well, so you're passing the buck, right? That's I told that's you. That's exactly what I'm doing. <laughs> it didn't give so. you time to process, but I told you. <laughs> yeah. So uh, just really quickly, looking at slide 18, because I do think we've ticked off a number of the cultural warning signs. So unless anybody has uh, a finer point to put on this, I would suggest we move on to slide 19 and talk about key board level discussion tools. And Brenda, I'm going to start with you. And this is where we'll get into some actionable recommendations. But of course, while you'll tackle it from a board member's perspective, I think some of the things that you're going to share with us and some of the tools that you'll talk about really work for management just as well. Sure. Um, the um, NACD in their Blue Ribbon Commission report has a section called the Toolkit, which is great because it does give you some um, templates, it gives you examples, it gives you discussion questions that you can really use. And I'll talk about one of those tools today. It was actually a tool developed by Sidley and Austin uh, that gets at questions you can ask if you're really wanting to delve into certain areas. And there are two areas that I'll talk about. One is assessing corporate culture, and the second, tone at the top. And what are some of the questions that you can ask? And it can be used by, by audit professionals and compliance professionals uh, as they look at these things in their companies. Um, one that's not in the toolkit, but it should be, as I listen to Paul and pick up on something that Jilly said earlier, and that's transparency. Because if there's a lack of transparency, that's a big red, red warning flag, and it's something that 
that clearly I think audit and, and compliance professionals ought to look at. Um, but if, if I just read you some of the questions that are in that assessing corporate culture, does your uh, corporate culture and the way you do business reflect on the corporation's values? Does the board have adequate insight into the culture? Is a description of the corporation's culture by employees uh, in person or in the media? And these days, it, there's a lot on the media. Is it consistent with the corporate culture that the company states that, that they believe in? How are strategic business and operational dis decisions informed by broader ethical considerations? And if for, for someone who's looking at these things, many of these questions can be answered by taking the corporation's mission and value statements uh, and comparing them with their goal and objectives, with their strategic documents, uh, with what's on their website, with hotline complaints in terms of do you, do you see any trends there that are against the stated culture of the organization. So there are so many uh, ways in which an organization or someone looking at it can really just do a short test to say, okay, how are we doing here? And I think that makes sense and it's a great tool to use. The second one, it was managing a tone at the top and I think everybody here has talked about that. So I'm not sure I need to say a lot about that. Uh, but I think one of the things that we haven't said is that this really should, should go beyond the board and the CEO because it needs to be at every level of the organization and the managers and the foremen who are supervising those people and how people do their jobs. So unless you have an appropriate tone cascading throughout the organization, you're not going to, to be able to instill the culture the way you want to. Uh, one of my former boss, actually at City, uh, used to say that uh, the fish rots from the head. Now, I don't know whether that's true biologically. <laughs> There's a lot of debate about that. <laughs> but he got his point across. <laughs> he got his point across. And so I think that, that, that you really have to take a look at that. And so for, for those of you who really want to delve in uh, to some of these questions, uh, I would really encourage you to go to the NACD Blue Ribbon Commission Report, pull the toolkit up so that you can, uh, it's really a good learning device. So, uh, Mark, uh, going over to slide 20, while the fish rots from the head, uh, <laughs> yeah. eventually it rots everywhere, right? <laughs> and so we have a lot of questions from the audience about what are metrics that companies can use to assess employees not only their culture, but uh, how they're perceiving the culture. And I know a common tool are culture surveys. Uh, so if you could talk a little bit about how City might use those and, and what you hope to gain from those. And then uh, I'll open it up because we also have a skeptical question about culture surveys. But, but very good. Well, I, I think that there are many, many organizations which will have uh, various types of uh, employee uh, surveys that are conducted uh, and um, that they typically uh, have uh, a range of questions that go to uh, everything, <coughs> excuse me, how, how you feel about the, uh, the company, um, does the, the company um, uh, respect what you do, um, do they value you, do they uh, train you, uh, is the work you do uh, uh, doing the right thing, uh, are your skills being used, um, but also probe into two areas uh, about uh, the, uh, the environment. Um, uh, and uh, uh, can you raise questions, uh, as we were discussing before? Do you feel that, um, uh, that if you challenge uh, that, uh, that there's a risk of retribution, uh, retaliation, that, uh, and those sorts mm -hmm. of things? And what we've, we've found is that um, uh, an annual survey, going back to a point that, uh, that Jilly was saying earlier on, that, that is a single point in time and there's an awful mm -hmm. lot of encouragement that you get a high participation rate and, uh, and uh, it's at risk of being a little bit artificial um, uh, and uh, uh, that annual result. So what we've done is, is uh, adjusted it to a series of pulse surveys, a pulse um, uh, em employee um, taking the pulse sessions, uh, which are, have a limited number of questions, because if you're given 40 okay. or 50 questions also, the, the, the risk is that you sort of just tap in um, a standard mm -hmm. answer, but if you have 
five, six, mm -hmm. and then they're focused on an area and think about it, you can give those over the course of the year and also, as Jilly was pointing out, track those micro changes that are going on. Uh, and, um, and at first, I think I was a little bit concerned about the partici participation rates um, because it wasn't that big push. Um, but ultimately, the, uh, the tracking data has been very, very helpful to, uh, to us uh, in leadership in the organization, business heads, uh, to, to get, get a better pulse on, on what's going on and to give gives us an opportunity to adjust more quickly and address concerns um, when they're kind of simmering uh, rather than uh, bubbling over. Um, uh, there are, uh, there are others. One could spend days on the, the different types of data analytics that one can get from different sources of activities and behavior in an organization. Um, but, it, but I think employee surveys can, can work, but they, they also have limitations, and, and part of those limitations um, have to do with how and when, uh, the structure, and um, the thoughtfulness of the questioning. Well, I think you answered the, the viewer mm -hmm. question, which was uh, sometimes employees might be reluctant to share their views on a culture survey, but maybe the Pulse Poll is a way to get the quick reactions without having someone feel as though he or she is totally opening the kimono uh, as to the, their thoughts. So, yeah, and I would agree with that. that. You yes. agree with that? Very good. So, um, turning to slide 21, and I am uh, appreciative of the time. Uh, there's a whole lot we could talk about with respect to leadership, selecting CEOs, succession planning, but one thing I want to talk about is how, from all of your perspectives, how should companies think about compensation and uh, retention when, uh, with respect to a company's values and behaviors? I mean, surely that has to... It has to be linked. Factored yeah, in, absolutely. right? It has to, it has to be linked. Um, and, and one of the, interestingly enough, one of the um, case studies in the toolkit for NACD is of a company who uses a compensation modifier. And that compensation modifier is done at the end of the year, and it, it's based on whether an individual um, did something really, really great that, that spoke to the company's values. What did they do? And they can be nominated, you know, by their manager, by their peers, whomever. Did they really do something that really just just talked about the company's values, or did they do something that violated the company's value? And, and not, not a violation that would speak to being fired or terminated, but did they do something that, you know what, this just wasn't right, and you didn't do this the right way, and so therefore you should receive less compensation. And so that's really a direct link, I think, to the values and mission of a company. Something which is similar, and, and I think I've, I've seen this work well, is to have two dimensions to the evaluation discussion. What did you achieve, i.e. what sales did you make, um, you know, whatever your sort of mm -hmm. empirical measure is. And then, really importantly, say, well, how did you do it? Um, and always ensure that you've got the two things. So you might have had a brilliant sales record, but frankly, if you stood on everybody's heads, <laughs> um, elbowed everyone out of the way to achieve that, that's not great. And they both get equal weighting mm -hmm. in performance evaluation. So always making sure you talk about what and the how. And it, it's interesting, Jilly, the, uh, um, at, uh, at City this year, we uh, have made a, a, a move. Uh, and uh, historically, we had the what and the how, but we also then had the aggregate right. figure. Uh, and the, uh, what we're doing this year is that we're not having the aggregate figure um, because the, then there is a risk of, of how you aggregate. <laughs> uh, and so right. the what and the how, and it is driving really, really rich discussions um, because just as you suggested a moment ago, uh, having that, that balance, and, and we're, we're in the, the process now of discussing with, with the managers how the allocation of discretionary uh, uh, reward I is done, and you look at both of those and, and, and do you balance them? Uh, so it then drives those open discussions mm -hmm. about 
uh, not just did you meet your performance targets, the what, uh, but uh, w what are the what are the values that you lived? What are, how how have you met those leadership standards, yeah. uh, and and your uh, your conduct in the organization, um, and it really is promoting the the right sort of discussion. Yeah. And you just answered a question actually that we got from one of the viewers, which is how do you come across as not being overly prejudiced or um, overly judgmental? And I think that gets to the how, right? Yes, absolutely. Uh, so I, I think that's good that that's how you approach uh, the evaluation of an employee is both the what and the how. Um, so going uh, on to slide 22. Uh, talking again about uh, a balance between reward and recognition. Uh, maybe just to talk to each one of you uh, quickly about your thoughts on this. Um, as we look at slide 22, we can see that some of the things we've already talked about. But I'll just go around the room and see if you have anything to add, because we do have some finer points that maybe each one want to touch on. So Brenda, I'll start with you. I think that the only thing to add is that um, when you look at the how, uh, that Mark just mentioned, that that you do it, that you develop metrics around that, so that they are included in the balance scorecard, so that you're you're looking clearly at your financial met metrics, but on the other hand, you're looking at some of these other important cultural things, whether it's safety, quality, um, uh, social responsibility, whatever they are, but have metrics around them so that they are an equal part of the the uh, balance scorecard. And I, I would say I uh, absolutely agree with Brenda's comments. Uh, the challenge that we all have um, a, is that it's, uh, it's easy uh, to be positive with someone, particularly in the performance evaluation. It's really tough to, to give the, the, the tough message. And so um, uh, thinking about how you will be constructive in, in, um, uh, in uh, how to do better in something so you're driving the right behavior rather than alienating uh, the, the individual and having them close up. Uh, and so getting to those mm -hmm. metrics which are positive uh, and, and thinking when there isn't the, the great result on them, what is the, the constructive way to say, how, how do you move the dial? Excellent. Um, an executive I interviewed several years ago said to me, you don't shrink a company to greatness. Um, and, and so if you're going to grow and be great, you've got to tie these things together. It's got to be part of the key. So there's just some recent headlines I saw. Uh, Wall Street to CEOs disrupt or else. Sort of a warning of all the disruption and changes coming. I saw a quote from Bill Ford that says, we can't just sell more cars. we got to figure out how else are we going to make money in the future. And one big tech company, when I was at their headquarters, recently s said to me, their CEO said, employees, take risk. I need you to do this. We've got to grow and innovate, uh, but we need to know and be transparent on exactly what you're doing. So he's not going to be able to pull that off unless he, he puts the right culture along with it. And then the last one, uh, down in Atlanta, the Coke CEO was quoted with a front page headline as saying, he's asking his employees to make mistakes. Um, I love to hear that. but. Those are all industries that are feeling that pressure of we got to do better. We got to. It's just still about being a successful company, not just avoiding the negative. So, uh, Julie, maybe I'll, I'll give you the last word on this particular topic, given what Paul just said about risk taking and mm -hmm. making mistakes. Because where's the balance between good corporate culture and making sure that it's not an impediment to creativity and agility and risk taking and and uh, those types of things. Yeah, this one is really, really difficult, particularly in, in, in my industry where, you know, you just can't make mistakes as an auditor because it's so, it's such a big deal if you do. Um, so I think you have to think, think back from the mistake and think about, back to this word I've made up actually called micro behaviors. You have to look for what are the tiny micro behaviors that you might see around you and your colleagues that could indicate that somebody's moving in the wrong direction or that somebody's moving in the right direction and encourage these and, and work on these. So you're, you're thinking much, much, much earlier up the chain. Um, and in, in an industry where you know we've got to have zero tolerance for audit failures, of course we do. Um, I think you have to be very, very thoughtful about looking for the very early indicators. That's how I feel the way to approach it is. So moving to <coughs> slide 23, 
um, we've talked, I think, about these internal communications, but I'm going to switch over on you all because I've gotten a question which I think is really good, which is how do external stakeholders, uh, whether it's, it's customers or investors, regulators, how do they get a handle on how the company approaches ethics and culture and how um, to ensure that the people are living, walking the walk, uh, not just talking the talk. Thoughts on that from any of you? Well, I'll, I'll uh, take a jump at it. Um, uh, we have uh, in, uh, in the financial services industry, um, uh, in part through uh, work initially done by the Chartered Institute of Internal Auditors in the United Kingdom, worked with the uh, uh, UK regulators following the financial crisis to, to uh, uh, develop a financial services code which um, uh, requires of the internal audit uh, functions to uh, perform reviews of the culture of an organization and to report that and that information goes to uh, the conduct regulator and the prudential regulator. Uh, and. Um, uh, that that is uh, something that um, that helped uh, both the financial services organizations and the regulators get a better understanding of uh, uh, of the workings of the uh, uh, of the culture of the organization and what may be done uh, to address some of the challenges that we've discussed today with respect to. Uh, the right tone from the top, incredible challenge, and, and how you look at your compensation structures and, and the, the like. Here in the, the United States, what, what has also been very interesting is that we've had similar dialogues um, with regulatory agencies and, and some uh, 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 other interesting views, um, particularly because uh, and I think the, the regulators are very right in, in raising it, when you have organizations within uh, a corporation like internal audit or uh, or a compliance mm -hmm. function or a risk function uh, uh, look at culture and report up including the reporting to an external party um, they are actually part of the culture uh, and uh, and so one has to factor that in we discuss with our regulators the culture all the time uh, and I think that some of the ways that they get um, the 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 picture of an organization's culture are not just through reading the reports from management, reading the reports from internal audit, getting the results of external reviews from uh, third parties like uh, uh, the accountancy firms, but they need to walk the halls uh, mm -hmm. and, and talk to management and get a feel uh, at the, the board level and senior management level and different parts of the organization uh, of how the organization ticks. So it's that there's nothing that beats that, that direct contact. Well, we are near the end of our webcast. Mm -hmm. So uh, going to slide 24, I'm going to do uh, what I usually do. And that is uh, go around the table. We, we've covered a lot of ground. And if each one of you could give one key takeaway to our viewers, I'd like to know what that is. Um, so, Julie, I'm going to start with you. What's one thing you'd like our viewers to leave? Okay, with? so it's already up on the slide. Oh, for darn me, me. It's, <laughs> <laughs> it's all about cultural drift. These micro behaviors that means culture changes very, very um, infinitesimally every day. I'm watching that like a hawk. Mark? Well, for, for me, knowing that the organizations are very, very focused on misconduct uh, and the bad side, uh, I, I think it's really important to think about what motivates people. And so we should think about accentuating the positive and driving the right sort of behaviors, the right sort of culture, a good ethical culture. Paul? Um, we've heard a lot of great resources today. NACD Toolkit, I love that. The IIA has some great material. The FBI has formed a new GRC committee. I think people need to find the resources that are out there and use them. There's a lot of good stuff already available to get you started. Brenda, I'll give you the last word. Culture should be in the DNA of every company and every boardroom. Um, some call uh, DNA the molecule of life. Culture is the lifeblood of a company. And 
You must have a healthy culture if you want a long-term success in that company. Well, Brenda, I said I was going to give you the last word, but that wasn't entirely accurate because <laughs> I'm going to take the last word. As you should. <laughs> and in closing, I do want to express my appreciation to each one of you, to Mark Carowin, Brenda Gaines, uh, Julie Lord, and Paul Walker. Your joining us was just really, really insightful, gave us a lot of things to think about and I think key takeaways. I also want to thank all of our viewers, viewers watching today. Uh, we do this for you, so we'd really like to get your feedback. So you will see that you have a link to the survey that should have popped up in a separate window on your computer screen and I would ask you to please fill that out because we very much value your feedback. And for those of you who wish to obtain a copy of your CPE certificate, it will be ready immediately following the webcast. All you have to do is click on the CPE button at the bottom of your screen. If you don't have the opportunity to do that now during the presentation, you can get it uh, after 24 hours by logging back into the event and clicking that Get CPE icon. If you have any questions regarding NACD credit, please contact the NACD directly. For colleagues of yours who were not able to join us today, they can view an archive of this webcast, which will be available soon on both the CAQs and the Anti-Fraud Collaborations websites. So with that, I'm Cindy Fernelli of the Center for Audit Quality, wishing you all a good day, and given the time of year, a happy holiday season. So thank you. <laughs>